Hello everyone. Uh, I am Mihir Parikh from Palo Alto Office of Nishit Desai Associate. I welcome you on behalf of my colleagues who have joined from different offices uh, of Nishit Desai Associates um, to this webinar. Um, you can see the slides, the screen, uh, data protection law. Will India see GDPR-like regulations? So just quickly, we are a research-driven, uh, a strategy-driven, research-focused Indian law firm. We provide legal regulatory tax counseling to clients who are or aspire to be global. Uh, we have several core competencies, international tax, corporate securities, intellectual property, dispute resolution, and regulatory and public policy. In this webinar, uh, which is privacy and data protection, uh, will India see GDPR-like regulation? We will be primarily focusing on a proposed uh, law or a, a bill in India, uh, which is called Personal Data Protection Bill 2018. Uh, we'll be contextualizing the policy objectives and the measures. We will compare that with GDPR, uh, at the same time, we will also look at implications for different um, industries, specifically technology and financial services industry. Also, we have scheduled another webinar on April 24th, uh, which will focus on the fintech industry in India. So the speaker who are joining on this webinar are Mr. Vaibhav Parik uh, from our New York office, Ms. Gauri Gokhale from our Mumbai office, Aaron Kamath from our Bangalore office, and I am Mihir Farik from Palo Alto office in Silicon Valley. So again, thank you and welcome. Those who are joining an attorney in the US, we have applied for uh, MCLE or CLE credit with State of Bar of California and New York. Uh, the details are given to you via email, and the code for MCLE or CLE credit is PRIV2018, again, PRIV2018. So <clears throat> agenda, uh, after this introduction, speakers will do the presentations, and then we will have a question and answer session. And in the question and answer session, currently all the attendees are on the mute, but at that time we will open up uh, to specific attendees who have uh, requested the questions. Uh, you can also type the questions on chat in Webex. Um, and you can also email your questions to varsha.bhattacharya at nishitdesai.com. That is V-A-R-S-H-A dot B-H-A-T-T-A-C-H-A-R-Y-A at Nishit Desai, N-I-S-H-I-T-H-D-E-S-A-I dot com. So we look forward to your questions, and always you can, if you're connected through WebEx, uh, then you can type your question in chat. If you're connected through Chorus Call, we'll open up the audio link at that time. So let's get started. Before we look into the specifics of uh, 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 the proposed bill, let's look at the big picture at about 30,000 feet level. So let's look at different types of data first. So we understand that how government and other regulators are looking at different data uh, and where they want to have control, where they want to have access issues and all of those things. So the very first aspect in data is the personal data. This is the data about individuals who are uh, Basically, people like you and me, we have data about our name, our age, our social security number, our Aadhaar card, uh, all of those different type of data is personal data, of which a subset is what government, in, at least in India, calls it sensitive personal data. So those are the data which we, for which we are a lot more sensitive and we are more caring about it. Uh, then. Another type of data is transactional data. So whenever we are doing a transaction with a company, any kind of transaction, or with other individuals, or social media, or whatever, 
we are undertaking some kind of transaction communication. So there is a lot of data that is also transactional data. Now personal data is my data, which often I have to share in doing the transaction. So that's where the transactional data aspect overlaps with personal data. Then you have another type of data, which is called community data. Now this community data is not identifying necessarily an individual, but the idea is to collect multiple group of people, uh, which could be gender based, which could be location based, which could be um, race based, which could be any basis, but it is aggregated. I wouldn't call purely aggregation because there's a different meaning uh, of aggregated data. Uh, which is summing up of data. But in this case, it's a community data. Uh, if you are going to airport and the uh, airport camera captures your data, all of the data is still community data. And then you have another type of data, which is machine data. When you are using your cell phone, your browser, or going to server, going through different routers, a lot of data that machine collects and just connecting with other machines, uh, that data is called machine data. And that data is also connected with personal data in many ways, because if you're using the same phone over and over, there's a cookie aspect and all of those things, uh, which is then connected to transactional data or through community data with personal data. So these are different segments or different types of data. Now with this background in the mind, government wants to make sure that this data are treated in a proper manner, and that's where regulators are coming from. If we understand these aspects, we can understand from what side regulators are coming from. Uh, so they want to protect the data. So they want to control the access and the use of the data. So all regulations you look at uh, on data protection or privacy, they're primarily geared towards protecting different data in a different manner. So what are the underlying reasons for protecting data? The very first aspect one can call is privacy which is, according to the Supreme Court of India, it's a fundamental right, which is protected by Constitution of India. So as an individual, I want to protect my privacy. It doesn't matter whether other people will use that data or not. I just don't want them to know my data. There are a lot of data about you know, uh, my preferences uh, of all kinds, uh, what type of person I am, and all of those things. Uh, is I want to protect that with privacy. So the underlying fundamental principle for privacy protection, at least in the Constitution of India, is fundamental right. Another type of protection is the misuse of data. If somebody knows about me, they can misuse it for any purpose. And their idea is to protect the powerless, because a lot of times the companies and, and the larger entities are much more powerful than us as individuals. So that's where the government comes in to protect the powerless from the misuse or abuse of the data. Another area which is at the larger industry level, which is market dominance. When one company has a data which is proprietary collected, a huge amount of data, they can, that creates a market dominance which means other companies may not be able to easily enter into that market because they don't have access to data. So government wants to protect the data and the access to data in certain way in order to level the playing field in the industry. So other companies with different innovations can come up. And the last aspect is national security, which is even at a higher level, which is where the different countries are looking at if this data is shared across the wall, will that create any kind of security issues? And that's where the advantages of nations will come in. You can, you must be reading about China doing a lot of AI development, a lot of American companies are worried about, or American regulators are worried about. Same way with India, worried about some other regulate, other uh, companies uh, using data or allowing data. And that's where a lot of cross-border data flow restrictions also come in. So with this background as in mind, what has happened is that a new personal data protection bill has come up in India in 2000, and the driving forces are primarily two. One is right to privacy as a fundamental right. Idea is to protect autonomy and the trust of individual. And the second is growth of 
digital economy as India is growing, the digital economy is growing and the data is a critical means of communication. So idea is to create a culture that fosters free and fair digital economy as well as it ensures empowerment, progress and innovation in different industries specifically related to digital economy. So who are affected uh, by this bill? Every company, every startup, every private equity and venture capital, every angel investor that has any kind of business in India. However, the impact differs from one company to another company, one industry to another industry, and it can be managed to your advantage if you only understand the implications and the nuances of the law. So with this background, let's move into more detailed discussion and understanding about this proposed bill, uh, which is very far reaching. Uh, and for that, I would like uh, Aaron Kamath, my colleague, to come and talk about the key features and comparison with GDPR. So Aaron. Thank you, Nihir, for the, the lovely introduction and context setting to the personal data protection bill. 2018, which was um, released last year. So by way of background, the, the proposed law or, or the bill, as um, as Mihir called it, was um, was prepared and released by a committee of experts that were set up um, by the government um, who studied laws of various jurisdictions and had, uh, even before that, released a white paper um, with various preliminary thoughts and views and comparative analysis of various laws that they look into when framing this particular law for India. Uh, what we find and what we observed when the bill was released and upon reviewing it was that um, it was very akin to the GDPR that was um, that recently took effect in uh, May of last year. There were a lot of similarities and we felt in some cases um, the proposed law in India even exceeded and went beyond uh, certain terms um, that was in the GDPR. So the point of this exercise is to um, do um, an analysis of not only the GDPR vis-a-vis -vis the proposed law in India, but, but to give you an idea of how businesses, overseas businesses that in some way are looking to operate or that already operate in India with or without a physical presence, if they have already taken various steps towards GDP, GDPR uh -huh. compliance, um, to give them an idea of what may be um, additional um, that they may need to implement from an organizational and a business standpoint. So that's, that's the short objective, um, what, what I'll be trying to cover over the next 10 minutes. Um, essentially for companies that are already looking to GDPR or have been looking to GDPR and what they should keep in mind when, um, if and when the law applies, the Indian law applies to them uh, by virtue of um, any nexus to India, which I'll shortly explain. So I think the first thing, you know, to start with would be the, the application of the law in itself. And very similar to the GDPR, the the bill has extraterritorial application. Before we go to extraterritorial application, um, the bill, the more the more simpler part of, of, of the applicability is that it would apply in the case where any kind of processing happens in India such as collection, storage, transfers, um, handling, any type of uh, processing happens in India. In that case, the law would automatically get triggered. The law would also get triggered if certain processing activities were to be undertaken by any company that is incorporated in India or any Indian individual. So these are the two cases um, where there is an access to India. Either the processing happens in India or the, it happens by an Indian company or by an Indian citizen, right? Where the where the law could have extraterritorial jurisdiction is where there there are foreign entities, but by virtue of them carrying out certain activities, the law would apply to them. For instance, if a foreign if if a foreign company, if a non-Indian company, were to collect and process certain data from from uh, from individuals in India, uh, by virtue of it having some sort of a business connection to India or by systematically offering goods or services to individuals in India, or if it were to collect and process data by virtue of it uh, conducting some sort of profiling of individuals uh, in India, 
then the law would also apply to such overseas entities. Also, a very interesting point is that the law doesn't differentiate between data of Indian residents vis-a-vis -vis data of foreign residents. So what this essentially means is that, and what I just said was that, where an in, individual is merely located within India, irrespective of the person's residency, if that data were to be processed or handled by an entity, the law would apply by virtue of the individual being within India. So that, that gives us a general overview of the applicability. Um, we get a few terminologies um, <clears throat> Excuse me. We get a few terminologies uh, out of the way, so that we're all um, we're all familiar with, um, you know, uh, what controllers and fiduciaries are. So, so to begin with, we are well aware of what a controller is under the GDPR. It, a controller is basically an entity which determines the purpose and means of processing of the data. Um, the Indian law has taken a similar stance, except the Indian law classifies such an entity as a data fiduciary. So a data fiduciary is akin to a data collector under the GDPR, an entity that basically determines what happens to the data that is collected and is in primary control of the data that is collected. The data processor, which is uh, an entity which processes it or conducts some kind of um, activity or analysis on the data on behalf of the controller, the same concept is under Indian law. So the processor, the concept of a data processor remains the same. Although interestingly enough, the Indian law proposes that a processor has limited liability as well as compliances um, under the law. Um, there are certain security requirements that a processor is required to take. Um, over and above that, liability is minimal as primary liability and of course compliances would lie on the fiduciary itself. The law, unlike the law today, uh, which only applies to electronic uh, means, um, the data which is um, um, processed electronically, the law applies to both manual and automated processing of data, right? And this is a very big deviation from our current law. Um, one, th there is one small exemption is where uh, data is manually processed by small entities, then an exemption is given to them from complying with the law. Uh, for instance, if there are certain turnover requirements or uh, very less volume of data is collected by certain small entities, um, only by manual uh, means, that is, processed by manual means, um, then that, that exemption would be able to, um, would, would apply to such uh, entities. Now, to what data does the law apply to? That's, that's probably the next important question after the applicability in itself. What data is protected under the law? Again, this is very similar to the GDPR. There is a concept of personal data uh, under both, and, and both essentially have the same meaning, personal uh, information, personal data. Um, the GDPR classifies certain data as sensitive um, and requires that, that such data be processed um, on the basis of uh, consent and only if it's required uh, in the vital interests of an individual. And there are certain extra compliances uh, prescribed under the GDPR for certain sensitive categories of data. Uh, a similar approach has been taken by um, uh, by the committee when drafting this law. Uh, so th there is a specific category of sensitive personal data. Um, and right now there are um, there are 12 specific kinds of data which are classified as sensitive. And the government can from time to time notify additional sets of data that, uh, that may be sensitive. Um, there are compliances applicable for both. And uh, the, the general thumb rule is that for the collection, processing, and transfers of personal data, consent is required. For the same activities related to sensitive personal data, an explicit consent is required. And of course, there are some additional thresholds which have been prescribed for explicit consent, um, uh, so that um, you know um, that that is uh, maintained by entities dealing with sensitive personal data. Um, and in no way can it can it be implicit or implied. Um, on the obligations, um, especially with respect to notice consent. Um, and certain other obligations, grounds for processing. Again, um, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think there are more interesting deviations um, to address. But um, there, there are certain points that um, that MNC is that that overseas businesses looking at India should keep in mind, because I understand that a lot of documentation may have already been reviewed from a GDPR compliance, but there may be certain additional um, compliances in respect to this. For example, in a notice that's shown to an individual. The individual is also supposed to be made aware of the source of collection. And if indeed the source of collection is not uh, the data fiduciary or the data controller itself, but a third party, that should be made 
known to the individual. Additionally, there are certain local law, uh, local language requirements. Um, as you know, India has a lot of state-wise regional uh, languages, um, <clears throat> a number of them. Um, so what, what, what the proposed law says is that notice should also be made available in regional languages which the individual may understand, of course, uh, subject to practicality. Um, uh, so that, that may be determined, um, there may be no clarity on that at a later stage. An overarching, you know, very important point and which will address a lot of these smaller implementation and operational points uh, of the law is that it, it, there is a co-regulatory mechanism imbibed in the law. So once the law is enacted, we may see, we, we would see in fact codes of practice which are set up, which will, which will give finer points, um, you know, on these, uh, on these operational uh, uh, points. And uh, the codes of practice would need to be blessed and approved by a separate data protection authority, which would also be set up uh, under the law. In terms of um, grounds for processing both personal data and sensitive uh, personal data, again, uh, the general grounds are available, such as um, you know, with consent, or if it's required to respond to a government request, if required to be produced person to a court order. Interestingly enough, um, there's also a concept of necessity which is there today, uh, whereas if, if, if data needs to be collected um, or processed or transferred in case of, say, a medic, medical emergency, then the consent requirement is relaxed. There's also, interestingly enough, um, an, um, a ground for processing, which is in employment cases, such as recruitment, appraisal, and all of that, which my colleague, uh, Deva, would deal with uh, when dealing with specific industry impact um, on the employment-related uh, points. Um, in terms of broad principles related to collection, purpose, and, and storage. Um, again, um, there, there are very minor deviations. Overall, the concepts seem to be um, very aligned. For instance, um, a business can only collect the data for which is actually required to provide the service. Once the data is collected, of course, the data can only be processed for the purpose for which it was actually collected. Although no specific retention time periods have been prescribed under the law, the, the overarching uh, the thumb rule is that the data can only be stored for as long as it is required to be processed and not longer than, and not retained longer than that. There is also a positive obligation to delete the data um, once it's, it's no longer required. Um, I, interest, I, I'll go to you know one of the hottest topics you know under the law, uh, which is um, the cross-border data transfers and data localization. Um, Miki, it would be okay if we go to that slide. Yeah, so similar to the GDPR, there are certain compliances which would apply uh, in the case of uh, cross-border transfers for both personal data, which is basically the personally identifiable in information, for example, a person's name or a contact number or an email address, and sensitive personal data, which could be financial data, medical data, um, uh, data relating to caste and things like that. Um, there are the, the compliance requirements um, overlap in certain cases, um, but not in certain cases as well. For example, look, there are codes of conduct under the GDPR. There are no certain, there are no approved codes of conduct under uh, the proposed law. What's common is that uh, there could either be an adequacy certification in place, which means that a particular transfer to a country or an organization or a particular region is approved by the Data Protection Authority in India, or alternatively, uh, an entity could have model clauses um, or binding corporate rules in place, which are very common, especially amongst group entities um, you know, situated worldwide to facilitate cross-border data flows. Um, the model clauses, of course, very similar to the standard contractual clauses, which have now been around for, for quite a while and uh, under the GDPR and are still being used under the new um, regime. Um, and there's also an exemption to either the binding corporate rules um, or the uh, model clauses or the uh, adequacy certification is that if a specific permission is taken on a case-to-case -case scenario from the authority of where a transfer is, where cross-border transfer is required due to specific necessity or emergency cases. Um, on localization, this is where, um, you know, the, the, the proposed law in India tends to uh, deviate quite a bit from uh, the, the, the GDPR and um, now even talking about um, the overall uh, you know, mindset of the government and where things are heading, um, you know, will also give um, 
you know, more clarity on this. But what the proposed law in India requires, and unlike the GDPR, which doesn't have a localization requirement, by the way, the Indian law requires for both personal as well as sensitive personal data, at least one live serving copy of the data should be maintained on a server or at a data center located in India at all points of time, right? Um, for, for personal data, it may be relaxed uh, with permission from the government, but this would be the general rule for all kinds of data. There's also an additional third category of data, which is known as critical personal data, which today has not been defined or listed, and we don't have clarity on what it could be. This is something that the government could separately notify and classify certain data as critical personal data. And the result, the consequence of that would be that such data would not be allowed to be transferred overseas at all. So it only has to be stored in India. Um, based on the report, the explanatory memorandum by the committee released, you know, with the, with the, with the bill, um, is that we understand that so this kind of data could be medical-related data, it could be IDs and official identifiers of people, and essentially data which the Indian government may not want, um, you know, to sit in a foreign country, uh, which could potentially be accessed by not only foreign companies, but, but by foreign governments as well. So there could be, um, um, you know, uh, the government's interest also, uh, there is, is in fact government's interest uh, in mind with regard um, to this kind of data. Um, I'll spend, um, you know, uh, two more minutes. One minute I'll, I'll quickly spend on certain rights which have been given to users um, under, under the law. Um, right to access data, right to rectify data, both again um, correspond with the GDPR. However, there are, as I previously said, a couple of cases where it has exceeded. So a couple of additional compliances um, would need to be kept in mind by MNCs, even if they have already taken steps to comply with GDPR. For example, if an individual accesses certain data, the um, the entity that's processing the data, the, the fiduciary, the controller, as you call it, would need to prepare some kind of a summary of all the processing activities which are undertaken for that particular data and submit it um, to the individual. So that's something over and above you know, what's uh, a compliance requirement that's already there, right, to rectify. Once the data has been rectified in an entity system or a platform system, the platform being the controller would also need to identify processors or back-end um, or other entities which whom it's being transferred to or processed about the change in the data. So these are certain additional day-to-day -day operational compliances that have been, um, um, you know, placed on um, on controllers, um, you know, in India. Um, Right on, on uh, the right to be forgotten is also a right which is um, imbibed uh, in the Indian law. Right to portability um, would be addressed a little later on on the industry impact, uh, which my colleague Beba would take. The right to be forgotten is essentially the same right under the same circumstances. Um, you know, for example, where the individual has withdrawn his consent, or um, an individual uh, does not feel uh, she doesn't feel that it's necessary to be online anymore, they can request for a takedown. The only thing, the only the, the difference is here under Indian law, it's a limited right, which means that if a request is made, it would have to go to a, an adjudicatory officer, and only if the adjudicatory officer approves it, it would be taken down. Um, so a, a request isn't necessary a corresponding obligation um, for takedown. Um, I believe, um, you know, um, I may have barely 30 seconds to a minute left, so I'll 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 spend. Uh, maybe 15 seconds on, on, on data breaches. Now, the GDPR requires that uh, data breaches are required to be notified to data subjects, to individuals, um, along with specific information such as what data has been compromised and, and what is the potential harm. Uh, this differs under Indian law. So what controllers or fiduciaries under Indian law would need to do is that they would need to report data breaches to the authority and not to the individual at the first instance. If the authority feels that it is necessary based on the potential harm that may be incurred, if, if, if the authority feels it's necessary that the individual be informed, only then should the controller actually inform the uh, individual. In addition, um, broad compliances such as uh, technological uh, safeguards, processes of encryption, de-identification, privacy by design, um, all tend to be very similar data protection officers tend to be very similar. One interesting aspect, uh, you know, when I mention data, is on anonymized data. Now, the GDPR doesn't apply to both anonymized data and pseudo-anonymized data, right? Um, but that exemption is much smaller for Indian law. And I'll, I'll tell you how this would impact uh, 
businesses with, the, with an access to India, is that anonymization has been defined as a process of anonymizing data which is irreversible, right? And only if it's irreversible would such data be anonymized data. So merely if data is de-identified or pseudo-anonymized, but the process is not irreversible, such businesses cannot take the benefit of the exemption given to anonymized data. In that case, if, if the de-identification of the pseudo-anonymization is temporary and not permanent, this would still constitute personal data. So this, we felt, was an exemption which was broader under the GDPR but not made fully available um, under the Indian law. And I'll close with the penalties, which of course is one of the big talking points um, of the law. Um, Indian, the proposed law in India has worldwide turnover, a percentage of the worldwide turnover as a penalty, or a particular sum um, amount, which is roughly about $2 million uh, in case of gross uh, breaches. So essentially the penalty here is linked to worldwide turnover, similar to the GDPR. It's clarified that worldwide turnover would not essentially be turnover of the entire group um, at various uh, places in the world, but would essentially only be related to ent group entities which actually are deriving some kind of benefit from the data or where there is some nexus um, to the controller. So that, that, that um, caveat has, that condition has been, uh, has been there. Um, a, a big deviation um, uh, from the GDPR is that the GDPR doesn't um, um, implement or doesn't prescribe for criminal um, uh, penalties, whereas the Indian law does. Uh, imprisonment could range for three to five years, depending on uh, uh, seriousness of the crime, once uh, intent has been proved. And of course, uh, last, there would obviously, you know, in addition to, uh, to criminal penalties, to civil penalties and fines, an individual would have the right to seek uh, compensation or damages from a controller for any harm or significant harm that uh, the individual experiences and is able to in, uh, is able to prove before the authority in the courts. So that's that's a very general you know um, overview of where you know we felt um, the, the law you know exceeded and certain considerations that should be kept in mind by businesses um, looking at India. Um, so yes, um, um, I now uh, like to give a, give. Um, the, the flow over to uh, Weber, who would uh, extend, um, you know, his uh, expertise you, and Rish. you know talk how it extends extends to certain industries in India. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Uh, okay, so what I want to do for next ten minutes, roughly, is uh, uh, take uh, a couple of industries, specific industries. Though I believe that the impact on most of the industry is similar, but uh, just to make a point, I will take three situations. One, I will take social media industry, uh, apps and consumer internet industry uh, from that perspective. Second, I will take, uh, uh, if time permits, I will take the software development industry, specifically the captive units um, for software development in India. The third, uh, I would possibly take is uh, fintech or financial services industry, uh, uh, specifically dealing with KYC and uh, you know similar financial data. Um, also, the way I'm going to do is, uh, I'm not going by my slides, but I'm going to do in the format of FAQs. So I will, I will, uh, uh, I'm looking from industry perspective and what most likely questions they are going to ask me and I will address those questions uh, uh, with my views. I think the first question which I believe uh, uh, I would want to uh, what I would like you to get is uh, if if we require consent of the user, uh, can I can the company go for opt-in or uh, or opt-out? Right? So does it need to be an opt-in or should it be? Can I do an opt-out process for getting a consent? Um, now, if you see the way the consent is defined, consent is defined specifically as uh, a consent which has to be uh, uh, pre specific, informed, clear, and capable of being withdrawn. Further, when it goes to they were defining what clear is or, or saying it, it specifically says that clear should be with respect to an affirmative action taken in that particular context. So, if, we, if you really look at all these things uh, together, uh, one takes, one would take the view that what law is specifically proposing 
is that it would be it would be more in terms of opt in rather than opt out um, because if 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 i have to consider what is an affirmative action it needs to be a specific selection of uh, uh, opting in to give consent uh, as opposed to uh, no action of uh, you know opting out so that's something you need to keep in mind when you are looking at whether it's an opting in or opting out um, however there are certain caveats which has been built in into the law a certain proposal a certain uh, uh, flexibility and uh, when the rules and the code of conduct have been drafted we would recommend the industry to come together and uh, and actually frame out so that all these things can be streamlined and least burdensome from company's perspective uh, the second question which i think i would get from uh, companies would be uh, whether company can collect any data what they want from the user right Uh, the answer is yes company can collect any data what they want from the user as long as there is a specific purpose for collection of the data right which means that if i don't have a purpose then i cannot go and collect data from the from the user so i need to be very clear what the specific purpose is and uh, the way the privacy policy should define or the way the the collection uh, consent should be defined purpose should be very clearly uh, specified i think then the further question is can i can i put a catch all purpose uh, which means that can i simply say that i need data for uh, purpose a purpose b purpose c and for any other purpose which i deem necessary in the future uh, the answer really is no um, because the law very clearly specifies that the purpose has to be specific the consent has to be specific uh for specific purpose because if it is if it is a catch all provision which means it, it just simply says that it can be for anything which i want in future uh then the, there is a good chance that the consent may not be a valid consent so while you your purpose can be for a future use also so it doesn't need to be for immediate use but it needs to be very specific uh uh for purpose of uh, getting the valid consent so when you are designing the designing the uh, uh the, the purpose is we need to think through you know whatever not not just the purpose what i am collecting data now but what i would need it to be used in the future and make sure it is included in specific terms um then the next question comes to my mind is uh, uh, if user does not give data what company wants can company deny the services right i mean it's very common uh, we see that in apps uh, apps will ask for all the all the different uh, accesses right access to phone access to photograph access to location access to you know other thing which are there in the phones um, or other data which is there in the phone right uh, now is that something which i can i can ask and if uh, user says no then uh, uh, can the company go and say i will not provide the services which is generally the case today uh, the answer the law proposes that company can only deny services uh, if the user does not give uh, uh, consent if that data is necessary for the company to provide the services so for example if it is a phone app which allows people to call and if user says i will not give you data i will not give you uh, consent to to uh, my phone database then obviously company can say look if you can't give me data to your phone database i will not provide you service but if company is asking for sort of, uh, access to photographs then whether not uh, providing the access can company say i will not provide you the service the possible answer is no unless company has some features which requires them to use photographs so so your company needs to be very clearly identify what uh, uh what features require which data and to ensure that if that data is uh, uh not given then they can deny services but if the other data that they can't deny services so this is something which you need to keep in mind um 
Another question which comes to your mind is, uh, can I retain the data even after user has uninstalled the app or has has uh, uh, stopped using the services, right? Now, uh, as Aaron mentioned earlier, uh, the data needs to be deleted once the purpose for collection data is uh, completed, right? It needs to be, it can be retained only till it is required. But if the purposes are properly identified, uh, uh, properly specified, which requires data to be kept, even after user has uninstalled or user has uh, uh, left the services, uh, the company may be in a position to keep the services. And this is an example. Uh, if company uh, is requiring data uh, for doing a reference check uh, in the future or checking whether uh, this user has been the past user or not, then to that aspect, uh, company can uh, retain the data because uh, uh, this is some this is the purpose they've actually listed it down when they collected the data so that is something which a uh, company needs to keep in mind um, another question comes uh, does company need to mask the data uh, you know Aaron talked about uh, de-identification so can company is company required so if company is collecting data do they require to mask the data before they store the answer really is that it is not strictly mandated but as a part of security processes, that's what government has uh, listed down, that uh, companies should, uh, you know, uh, de-identify, uh, put the data in a de-identified state uh, so that if tomorrow uh, there's a breach, uh, you know, all is not lost. Uh, so that is what, uh, that is what uh, uh, the law says with respect to uh, masking the data. Uh, another question is, what happens to derivative data? You know, uh, is it something which I can, I need to, uh, uh, is it something which I need to uh, delete it or is it something, you know, who owns that data? Um, this law does not talk about the ownership of data at all. There may be another laws which may come in future which may talk about the ownership of data. But as of today, if you are, if you are having a derivative data, and if it is an anonymized state, then you own the data. If it is not in an anonymized state, and if it is a derivative data, then that may be linked to the personal data of the user, and certain compliances with respect to personal data may have to be followed. Um, another question is, uh, you know, what is data portability, and, and how does it affect, uh, you know, such company? Um, as I mentioned earlier, on data portability, the law is, uh, law is, uh, going beyond what we have seen in other parts of the world. Uh, A, it says uh, uh, that you need to give data to either the user or to another person uh, given by the user um, where the data has been given by the user or the data has been generated while the user has been, been uh, using the services or data has been created or obtained from a third party by such company or where this data is there as a part of profile of the user, which means a part of a derivative data. Then all this data needs to be transferred to some third party defined by the user or given to the user. Now, obviously, uh, there are exceptions and it says it's only required when it is done to automated means. And secondly, as long as it does not reveal state secrets. Uh, in lack of time, I will not go into details of this, but if there's any question on this, uh, happy to answer. Uh, just coming to two more questions I will address. First is when, when with respect to software uh, uh, developer center or captive data, what is the implication? You know, is this law even applicable? The answer really is that the, the only aspect where it should be applicable uh, is in respect to employees. And all the situation which we just described uh, earlier uh, is also ap applicable to employee data. So, for example, when employee, uh, the data is uh, uh, taken from employees, you need to go and do a specific purpose. Why is taken? When employee leaves the, uh, the company, they can possibly ask for that data to be transferred to the new employer. Um, not just data which employee has given, but also, for example, if you've done a background check, verification check, or if you have, uh, you know, um, created a particular uh, a file on employees which includes this data in respect of, of uh, uh, the personal data with, of the employee, then that needs to be transferred. So this is something which we need to keep in mind when it comes to employee uh, or ex-employee. Uh, you may be able to retain the employee data if your 
uh, even after that per employee has left, provided you have actually uh, uh, you have actually put the purpose. Example: I want to do a reference check in future uh, in case you apply again, or uh, I will keep the data for purpose of reference check. If a third party is going to come back and ask me the data, uh, ask me for a reference check. So, if your purpose is cover uh, the usage, then you may want to uh, then you may want to. Uh, uh, you can retain that data. I think uh, last question, uh, and I will address it very quickly, uh, is with respect to sensitive personal data because the financial services uh, companies generally deal with uh, sensitive personal data, which includes password, biometric, etc. Specifically, when it comes to KYC. And uh, as Aaron was mentioning, there is there is a explicit consent required. I think a couple of points just to keep in mind that just not explicit consent is required. Uh, uh, it also, uh, the, the law, proposed law also says that the user needs to understand the implication of what they are consenting to, which means that uh, it has to be properly, they need to be properly informed of the consequences of uh, such uh, data being given to the, uh, to the company. Uh, so tomorrow, if a user comes and says, look, I didn't know that you're going to use data for this particular purpose. Had I known, I would not have given it to you. Or, you know, I didn't know the implication of this particular thing. You know, uh, had I had I uh, known that this is the implication, I would not have given the data to you. Then the burden is on the company to go and say that, look, they had told about the implication to the, empl uh, to the, to the customer, and they had told about, uh, uh, you know, uh, what can happen, and if they are not able to do that, then there would be a, the consent may not be considered to be explicit consent. I think with this, I will uh, close my uh, my talk and hand over to Gauri uh, to take it further. Thank you. Thanks, Saibhav. Uh, since we are, you know, sort of limited on time, what I'll focus on is where do we go from this bill? Uh, so let me just lay out the timelines. Uh, as we know that India is getting into general elections, uh, as we speak, you know, tomorrow we have the first uh, uh, leg starting of that election. So this law may be taken up by the cabinet of the country only after the election, maybe sometime in June, July. And thereafter, you know, the parliament of India will consider that. It may or may not go before the parliamentary committee. If it goes before the parliamentary committee, then, uh, you know, that may be another uh, six, five, six month process. Uh, but if not, then, uh, you know, there, there may be some consultation at the parliament level. Both houses of parliament will have to pass the law. Once the law is passed, uh, it will have to be given a notified date. Now, when that notified date may come up, uh, we don't have that visibility. But once the notified date is given, within three months, the data protection authority will have to be appointed. Now, in the Indian context, we have seen often that, you know, the authority uh, itself may take some time to get appointed. Thereafter, the authority has about 12 months to come out with the codes of practices. So uh, when I say thereafter, I'm saying, you know, from the notified date. And once the codes of practices that both uh, Aaron and Vaibhav have referred to, once the codes of practices are out, which is, you know, the 12-month period I mentioned, then you have only six months to implement. So unlike GDPR, you had a reasonable amount of time for implementation. From the, uh, uh, you know, notification date of the law, we have very limited period of implementation. So where do we go from here from the industry perspective? Two action points in our view. Number one, uh, of course, we need to do the complete data mapping when it comes to Indian data. Number two, well needs to sort of figure out whether the notices, consents, etc., that were mentioned, uh, even if you're GDPR compliant, where is the gap? And try to sort of implement uh, your notices and consents in line with the proposed law. The reason I say this because the law currently is very fuzzy when it comes to the past data and how the processing will be permitted after the data uh, protection law comes into effect. So advice would be to try to align the, you know, Indian collection processing, et cetera, with the proposed bill at least, so that uh, even if, uh, you know, by the time the law comes into effect, at least that data is sort of kosher for further use. 
Um, then the next step would be, of course, to start discussion on the codes of practices. Again, the reason I say this is because though the law is uh, still, uh, you know, some some time away. Uh, if the industry itself uh, may take some time to come together and sort of align its thought process in so far as the codes of practices are concerned. And in India, uh, you will find, you know, variety of industries coming together, trying to align themselves itself may take a lot of time. And therefore, it is important that whenever the data protection authority is ready for its operation, the industry is actually ready with its codes of practices so that it can, you know, have those further discussions and deliberations and is ready for the implementation as and when, uh, you know, the law gets into effect. So uh, that is insofar as the present law is concerned. The What we hear and uh, from, a, from a, you know, some of the provisions that we mentioned, what the industry is hoping, that the data localization norms are somewhat liberalized and not made so stringent as is in the bill. That is one hope. And the second hope, which I'm not too confident about, is in relation to the criminal liabilities, right? So if at all uh, these two points are addressed, a lot of concerns may uh, get addressed. Uh, the third being uh, contract as a as a ground of processing. Unlike GDPR, we don't have that. So that is likely to again come up, uh, you know, through industry consultation through the codes of practices under a particular provision of the law. So these are the three, four uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, changes that the industry is hoping that we are able to get to before the law is actually brought into effect. Uh, moving on to the overall scheme of things, I think uh, some of you who attended the last uh, webinar that we had on e-commerce policy, overall, the government uh, thought process is how can we use the Indian data, number one, for betterment of the Indian population, and therefore, should the government have access to the community data? So that is one big point that is coming out, uh, you know, of the entire discussion. Number two, how can we have access to the data of the individual for the purposes of investigation? Uh, because that is one big issue that is coming up, you know, from a, from a security of the country, et cetera, perspective. So uh, some of these issues may not get addressed in the current law, but there are other uh, you know, facets that are coming up, whether, uh, uh, you know, under the information protection, uh, in, under the Information Technology Act or the like. Um, the other point would be, uh, as I mentioned, the sector-wise approach uh, that we need to see uh, on this particular point. Yeah. So if you see, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the mindset of the government is to try to sort of have the foreign entities to create local presence if they are going to uh, sort of uh, use Indian data. So one way or the other, whether it is for intermediaries, whether it is for, uh, you know, significant data fiduciaries, et cetera. So there is some sense that the government sees that they will not have enough control over these foreign entities that are sort of, you know, sort of managing so much data of the Indian citizens. So there is a mindset and a thought process, how can we have them create a local presence and there could be tax reasons for that as well. But this is the other point that is definitely coming out. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so uh, government request for data. So in between, we did have a sort of uh, a flurry of activity when it comes to, you know, government accessing the data. So very quickly, I'll deal with this point and then I'll stop. So, um, in the in the context of uh, privacy, as we discussed, uh, privacy is considered as a fundamental right, and that right is of course uh, you know uh, sort of exercised only with respect to the government. And the data protection uh, uh, you know uh, bill is supposed or the act will be applicable to the uh, you know to the private party. However, one another important aspect is that the government. This is a horizontal law. That means the government is also covered under the Data Protection Act. So it's not as if only the private parties are covered, but only also the government is covered. So often the question raised is, in the hands of the government, is how is the data to be sort of, uh, you know, handled? So on that point, there are quite a, you know, bit of discussions uh, being undertaken. And the second one is when, when the government access requests for the data from the private party, then what should be the approach? So, you know, the Supreme Court judgments have given us some guidance. Uh, so this is one constant question from our foreign clients because they are very wary about 
government request for the data. So uh, one quick uh, sort of, uh, you know, takeaway uh, from whatever we have seen is that not all requests that come from the government may have necessarily followed the process that is required to be followed under the relevant law. So therefore, uh, please always, uh, you know, double check whether the necessary process has been followed and only then, uh, you know, one could sort of, uh, you know, adhere to that request. So there is a possibility where you feel uncomfortable, you want to challenge it, you definitely should explore whether uh, there is a good round of challenge for such government request. Uh, next slide. I think I've already dealt with the timeline here in so far as, uh, you know, the implementation of the law is concerned. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, so the last point being the competition commission. So we understand that, you know, there there is a likelihood of competition commission looking into the data monopolies and, you know, trying to look at uh, whether it affects the competition within India, et cetera. So that another angle of data is also something we should be sort of concerned about. Um, so Mihir, I'll stop here and we'll take the questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Gauri. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, we can actually continue question answer even after the time is up. I just want to take uh, 15 seconds to thank uh, Aaron, Gauri, and uh, Vaibhav for uh, coming uh, at the different odd times, especially for Gauri and Aaron, uh, to join us on this webinar. Um, so thank you, and uh, let's start with question. There was one question posted by Samir earlier. Aaron, do you want to take it up? Sure, thanks, Mihir. So um, I believe Samir had asked uh, a question around AI and machine learning and, and how it's uh, dealt with under the proposed law in India and uh, compares to the GDPR. So what the GDPR um, says about uh, automated decision making is that when a decision is made or when there is an activity conducted via automated uh, decision making, then the individual who is subject to the decision or which is subject to the activity has a right to know the rationale behind the decision, has a right to object and has a right to request for manual intervention. So these are, um, you know, three uh, you know, recourses given to an individual who may be subject uh, to uh, to AI or uh, automated uh, decisions. So there are more um, elaborate provisions in the GDPR surrounding uh, AI um, and machine learning. In the proposed law, we do not have specific provisions on AI machine learning. Um, there are there there are there there isn't an exhaustive uh, you know provision uh, like this. However, there is mention of it. Um, in, in one place. Uh, there is a definition of harm, and harm is defined as, you know, certain things, A, B, C, D. And where harm is experienced by an individual, the individual can go and seek compensation uh, from the controller, from the fiduciary. One of the criteria, one of the ingredients of harm is where there is a denial or a withdrawal of a service or a benefit or a good resulting from an evaluative decision about the individual. So say if there's any denial of service or denial of a benefit given to an individual as a result of an evaluative decision via AI or ML, then if the individual is able to show that he or she has incurred some amount of harm, then there is a recourse to go and seek compensation. A very small example is that, say, in a recruitment process, um, if AI is deployed by the entity to sift through candidate applications, right, and if, um, if, if, if an individual makes a claim that there is some bias and uh, maybe on gender or race or whatever it is, uh, if there's some kind of bias uh, within the, you know, the AI system making the decisions, if the individual is able to show that there is harm and that's why uh, that, that partic uh, particular person or, or, or a group of persons didn't get the job, then they could go and seek compensation for the harm caused. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Uh, we also have a chorus call platform connected to the webinar, which is only an audio line. So Stanford uh, is a coordinator. Uh, Stanford, are there any questions from the chorus call line? Uh, sure, sir. I'll check for them. Participants on the audio call, if you wish to ask questions, please press star, then one on your telephone keypad. 
We take the first question from the line of Shilpa Bajoria from McAfee Software. Please go ahead. Hey, hi. Uh, so uh, my question is that uh, do we have anything specifically called out for the cloud services in the data protection bill? Uh, this Viber here, um, no, I don't think there is any specific thing which has been uh, called for cloud uh, services in data protection bill. Uh, there are different, different uh, ministries who may be coming up and coming out with the law, but that's not covered in this data protection bill. So, so the answer is no, nothing has been specifically called out for them. Yeah, so if you see, uh, the, the, the government, when it comes to its own data platform, right, or its own data, you may recollect that they had come out with a particular notification or a circular that insofar as government data is concerned, uh, they wish they wanted the servers only within India to support the cloud, uh, you know, the, I mean, basically the cloud to be hosted only on the Indian servers. So to that extent, there may be something or the other, but what we hear also is that overall on the cloud, uh, though TRI had come up with a policy uh, or a consultation, TRI may start looking at that particular point uh, all over again, uh, you know, uh, oppose that consultation. So you may we may have to wait and watch how the TRI uh, sort of, you know, uh, comes up with its own approach on the cloud overall. The next question is from the line of Ashish Jain from Xaviant Software Solutions. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. So I had a question on the employee data. So we uh, collect a lot of employee data uh, for various purposes uh, and that has to be shared with different people. Like we have to share, might have to share that with the uh, stat auditors. We have to share that with the banks. We have to share that with the uh, uh, insurance company, so medical insurance uh, uh, renewal purposes. So uh, how is uh, that covered under this law? Uh, how, how to take care of, do we need to take consent from employees uh, uh, to, uh, to share uh, their data for these purposes as well? Uh, so how does it work? So, so our our recommendation would be to when you take the data right uh, when when an employee joins uh, the company at that point of time you take data for all these purposes which you need to do for purpose of employment right uh, so that's something which uh, which is uh, beneficial though there are certain provisions in the in the law which may allow you to do it uh, also uh, but our recommendation would be to take specific uh, consent yeah, because, uh, you know, just to, to elaborate, uh, you know, the, the employee-related carve-out that has been provided is only in relation to general personal data and not in relation to sensitive data, right? Um, so the points that you mentioned, some of which, for example, health-related information or financial information, etc., most, you know, some of that could fall within the bucket of sensitive information, right? And when you have, uh, you know, when you have a com combination of personal and sensitive, it becomes very difficult then to, you know, take consent for one, not for the other, etc. So that is the reason we recommend that ideally try to take consent and uh, do notice, uh, etc. The processes for the entire data set. So then there is no confusion what should or should not be shared uh, from a from a practical perspective. All right, and should and is there any provision to take a, a blanket uh, a consent from all the employees in one go? Uh, because uh, for uh, any new joinee, we can definitely uh, set up a process where we are taking their consent at the time of joining. But for the existing employees, uh, so uh, because so that's a valid are, yeah, that's a valid point. So let me just give you you know sort of uh, the historic approach. So in 2011, when the when the you know date, the, the the data protection rules came out under uh, the Information Technology Act for the purpose of sensitive personal data and information, the exact issue had arisen, and at that point in time, you know different uh, approaches were adopted for you know sort of validating the past data. So in more you know so 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 what we we'll probably need to wait and watch is whether the data protection authorities comes up with some guidance for validation of the past data. Otherwise, they're absolutely right. It's going to get a nightmarish, uh, you know, situation where you have to sort of uh, get into personal, you know, each and every uh, level personal consent. 
but we hope that at least for the past data there are certain exemptions or there are certain leeways provided today we don't have that visibility but uh, we hope that you know there there are certain leeways provided for the past data but in absence of any any exemption or directions provided by data authority uh, if you're going to use these sensitive uh, person information, you may require explicit consent uh, once this law is passed, uh, as long as you're going to use that data uh, after the going law. Going forward, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so like the sharing of data, the uh, employer related data with uh, stat auditors might come under the uh, mandatory requirement. So, uh, because it's a requirement uh, as per the uh, a statutory audit, right? So, uh, so, under those circumstances, also, uh, do we need to take the consent? Uh, yeah. Or? Um, I think what I suggest is if you can send us an email more detail. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. My apologies. No problem. There are many other uh, joinees who have questions. So uh, yeah, let's uh, limit one per person. And if any uh, detail questions you have, uh, kindly email us. We'll be happy to look into sure. it. Sure. Yeah? Thanks a lot. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. So there is a question from Saswati online. Uh, if there is anything under proposed law to give right to take a social media company to the court of law. Gauri, you want to take it up? Sure. So, uh, you know, in so far as the, you know, from a, from a, uh, so there are certain compliances under the Act, right? And if there are violations, so what they have done is they have categorized, uh, you know, the violations uh, in, in different buckets. One is violations relating to personal data and violations relating to sensitive personal data. And uh, if there are these, you know, there are identified violations, then there are three sort of uh, things that are likely to happen. Uh, you may alert the data protection authority upon which, you know, they start their own investigation and impose penalties. Simultaneously, you could actually have a, a, a compensation that is, you know, awarded to the individuals that are that has suffered harm. And the third one is in a very rare situation is in, in so far as the criminal liability is concerned. However, the typically uh, in case of violations, you will have to sort of at least, you know, indicate a harm or a significant harm in relation uh, to the data breaches. So that's a summary, but happy to, you know, uh, look at if you have any further detailed question over email, but that's a quick summary of the, um, of the remedies available under the law. Yeah, thank you, Gauri. Uh, there is one more question from Subhodip. Um, uh, as under the GDPR, is compulsory to inform the data principle required under the new DPBO? Could you repeat the question? Sure. Under GDPR, it provides for compulsory to inform the data principle, but under our DP bill, it does not provide for such compulsion. Can you share light or is there compulsion required to inform the principle? I'm honestly not clear about the question. Inform what? Uh, could you clarify? The data or? principal or the data owner, when there is a breach, they are required oh, okay. compulsory to be informed under breach. GDPR. Okay, 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 understood. So yeah. as we discussed before, in case of a breach, only if the data uh, uh, fiduciary believes that there is a harm likely to be caused to the individual because of such breach, they are supposed to notify the data protection authority. At that stage, they did not necessarily inform the individual directly. There is no mandatory requirement. But if the DPA believes that a, a, that a notification to the individual ought to be made, in that situation only, the individual notification will have to be made, but not directly, as is in case of GDPR. Thank you, Gauri. Stand for any other people on chorus call. The next question is from the line of Sandesh Atyam from National Law University. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is, uh, how does the uh, Personal Data Protection Bill treat consent from minors? And uh, secondly is, uh, considering the, we, ha we even have the DISHA Bill, the Digital Information, for, uh, say, uh, I think, healthcare, it's related to healthcare, will the PD Bill take precedence over the DISHA Bill? Uh, 
So I'll take the next, second question and then I, I'll pass on the children's data question to Aaron. So that's a very good question. And, uh, you know, in, I mean, we will, the, the way things happened, right? The Disha bill came in before, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the data protection bill. And the data protection bill essentially uh, sort of uh, has also suggested amendments to the other laws so that the other laws are brought in line with the data protection bill. So we will need to wait and watch whether um, they will allow, uh, you know, the data protection bill only to continue as a as an overarching law and not have data at all, or uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, have certain additional rules specifically brought out in, on the lines of Disha under the data protection bill itself uh, to apply uh, to them healthcare information. So we just need to wait and watch in this particular context. Uh, Ma'am, what about consent from minors? Yeah, Aaron? I'll deal with that. Yeah, I'll deal with that. Aaron here. Um, unlike the GDPR, which prescribes 16 years of uh, age, um, the age is 18 years uh, in India. So what the bill proposes is that where data of children is proposed to be collected and processed, um, where the child is 18 years or, uh, under 18 years of age, parental consent is required. The onus is on the controller, the fiduciary, to implement some sort of mechanism and um, and controls to not only collect the parental consent but also verify the parental consent given on behalf mm -hmm. of the uh, child. All right. From the line of Ranganath Kanolkar from Symantec Corporation, please go ahead. Uh, no, no, my question no is around uh, grounds of processing and uh, the ground for uh, of processing of personal data in compliance with law or order of court. It actually, uh, under the Indian bill, it says that the processing should be explicitly mandated under the law. So is, uh, how do we re interpret this then? Like, does the law have to actually call out that in order to comply that uh, the, the data fiduciary has to process the law and then only companies can take make use of this exception because this seems to be very restrictive as compared to the language in GDPR. Right. So this is Gauri. So I think, uh, you know, the way we were looking at this, right, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the idea was to make this a horizontal law but still allow the state government to or the, you know, the central government to have access to certain data for the purpose of the state, right? So I think most of these provisions are for compliance of the functions of the state that they may ask for the disclosure. And in that situation, a person, you know, consent may not be required from a disclosure or a processing perspective. So it is more in that context that this particular, uh, pro these provisions have been inserted. And, and, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, uh, so when we say explicitly mandated and under law made by the parliament, often we find that the law is not, uh, you know, very clear and the executives interpret that law and try to sort of, you know, seek that particular information from the private body, right? So one is when it is mandated by law, for example, uh, so you are required to say uh, for the security purpose, suppose it is told to all the, uh, you know, uh, all the ISP that for security purpose, you need to ensure that all the your your customers are uh, required to uh, sort of uh, you know adhere to parental control the 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 TRAI guidance that we have right and in such a situation if they are therefore requiring to you know process that data then that is you know that is one way to look at it. However, if that processing itself is viewed to be in violation of the privacy law, then one could still challenge that, that being a violation of a fundamental right. So it is going to get very complex uh, because these, uh, the interlinkage between privacy violations from a fundamental right perspective of the, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the state versus, um, uh, versus, uh, you know, the, the information that is ha in the hands of the, um, uh, you know, ISPs, uh, it is going to get complicated because the state will say that we want this data from the ISPs and therefore ISPs need to collect that data, right? So it is going to get complicated. I agree, you know, that it, this particular provision is very, very uh, broad and therefore it is likely to have, uh, you know, uh, sort of implications on both ways, in both ways. Mm -hmm. Sure, thanks. 
Okay, we'll take one question from Webex. Rohit has posted a question that given the underdeveloped IT infrastructure in our country uh, and IT security issues, uh, would it be a good idea to go for data localization? Or would the global company willing to store their precious data locally rather than securing it at much safer location outside the country? Vaibo, you want to answer this? Yeah, I will take it and maybe Gauri can add on if, if she wants to. Uh, in my view, um, government is looking at data localization from security perspective. And uh, I think from perspective of IT infrastructure development, if there is a need, then infrastructure will get developed. So, so I don't see anything wrong in government mandating uh, uh, data localization for, for for all the data to be stored in India. I don't think that that means that uh, you you compromising security because uh, the infrastructure will be developed and can be as secure. Uh, as it is outside India. In fact, we know that already there are there are uh, premises or uh, data centers which provide same level of security and same services, which otherwise is available outside India. So, the answer really is that uh, I think it is it is not an issue for mandating data localization um, uh, because it's required from uh, national security. So I think uh, just to add what we also hear, and one is the security when it comes to, you know, I mean, security vis-a-vis -vis hacking or otherwise, right? But typically what we also hear is that whether, uh, you know, having the data only, the, the, the question is, is it only within India, right? And whether the mirroring outside India will be allowed. So it is more for, uh, you know, disaster management, etc. that the, you know, large companies prefer that their data is stored at different locations. So from that perspective, if it's only in India, whether that will create an issue more from a from a data uh, a disaster management perspective or not, you know, these are the questions the industry has been raising. Uh, but as I said before, it is more likely than not that, you know, the data localization uh, requirements are likely, maybe, I mean, we just hope that uh, they are liberalized. But, uh, you know, having said that, these are, you know, the, the, there are multiple types of concerns that have been raised by the industry. Thank you, Gauri. There is a question from Chanakya. As a company, if I am forwarding my employee data to a health insurance company, and if a breach happens at the insurance company for not maintaining reasonable standards, then am I liable as a company too? For not doing the due diligence of standards of the insurance company, Aaron, are you there? Yeah, yeah, Aaron, yeah, hi. So yeah. um, I understood the question uh, correctly. If if an employer entity uh, uh, transfers its employee data to an insurance company and if there's a breach by an insurance company, then will the employer entity be liable for not doing due diligence on the insurer company, right? So uh, right. essentially, yeah, there would be two sets of uh, obligations. Uh, that would be in this case. One is a set of obligations on the employer entity that uh, depending on the type of data uh, and, and the transfer to take place to the insurance company, they would need to take the necessary consents um, as well as the notice uh, requirements and all of that. So the set of obligations that the employer entity would need to adhere to are separate and independent, right? Um, there may be uh, uh, including obligations to uh, put certain provisions in the contract that it may have with the insurer entity um, when, when transferring the contract, uh, when transferring the information to the insurer entity. Like we had mentioned, under existing law today, there is a simple provision saying that, uh, say if this were to apply under Indian law today, uh, the employer entity would need to put in a provision saying that the insurance entity would take, you know, the minimum amount of uh, 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 controls and measures to protect the data. Uh, there are more requirements under the law as we spoke about, uh, you know, data transfers. Uh, so from the employer entities end, you need to take necessary requirements vis-a-vis -vis the employee with consents and all of that, and in the documentation with the insurance entity. Separately, the insurance entity is a regulated, is a heavily regulated entity uh, by the IRCAI. There are uh, exhaustive um, uh, security and privacy-related obligations on them, including localization requirements and specific organizational security requirements for the data. Um, if there is any breach, um, 
being a regulated entity, they would also be liable for breaches at their end. Um, an action could be taken against them independently for not complying with the sector-specific data regulations. Thank you, Evan. Uh, this is another question from Ali Muhammad. Uh, how this new bill will impact the telecom industry, especially the cross-border telecom uh, aspects? Weber? So this bill is not, not telecom specific. In fact, telecom regulation itself has a, a substantial requirement uh, under, uh, you know, for purpose of sharing of data. For example, all the user data telecom, in, uh, telecom operator cannot share with anyone else without the consent. So all those things are already there. Um, this particular bill is not adding anything specific to telecom uh, uh, industry. All the all the requirements we just mentioned are applicable to telecom industry also, but in addition to what the TRAI and uh, telecom uh, license uh, obliges uh, to the telecom operator. Okay, thank you, Vibo. Stanford, anything on the chorus call lined up? Uh, no, sir, nobody in the queue. Okay, so there is one another question. Uh, I'm curious to understand how will personal data protection bill and its penal provisions be in harmony with Section 72A of the IT Act 2000, considering that the bill provides for deletion of Section 43A. Yeah, I'll take it in. It's, it's actually a very uh, short answer. So you're right. In the, the first schedule to the bill provides that only 43 and 87 of the IT Act will be repealed. So technically, 72A will continue to stand. Uh, however, given that it's the first draft, it, as Gauri said, would possibly undergo um, subsequent iterations and amendments. This could be built in by the time it goes to Parliament and um, gets uh, approved and becomes law. It could be a drafting oversight. Uh, we fully expect it. Um, it would be covered because these kind of provisions are already covered in the new bill. So it may have been a drafting oversight, which would most probably get uh, rectified uh, at some point of time before being notified. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Uh, another question from Samir. Uh, this one is actually very well addressed to you. The requirements of specificity of purpose stated by you relates that insofar as I understand to the principle of purpose limitation, can employee information, for instance, be retained for an undefined period of time in the grab of a potential reference check that may be carried out in the event of a reapplication. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's a, that's the point which I was mentioning that it may yeah. be possible for a company to retain, um, uh, let's say, the employee information which it requires for purpose of reference check. As long as that uh, company has made it clear that I will retain this uh, information for purpose of reference check, and uh, you know this is something which is not uh, uh, which is not uh, uncommon. Uh, people do reference check in future, and you know uh, companies get reference check of some employees who were left even ten years ago. So they need to keep that data for purpose of uh, providing the reference check. So this is something which, as long as it has been mentioned before, they can retain the data. Okay, thank you, Vaibhav. Uh, we are almost approaching midnight in India, so uh, I want to let the speakers go. I know there are a lot of questions and a lot of uh, things that you have on your mind. Uh, please drop us an email. We'll try our best to answer those. Uh, but thank you for joining the webinar, uh, uh, and we look forward to uh, you joining the next webinar on April 24th, which is on the fintech industry. So thank you, everyone, and good day, good night, uh, depending on wherever you are in the world. So thank you. Bye-bye.